Dr. Charlie Bamforth joins me this week to discuss flavors and yeast. This is Beersmith Podcast number 164. This is Beersmith Podcast number 164, and it's late January 2018. Charlie Bamforth joins me to discuss the flavors that come from yeast. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They have a great online learning platform at learn.beerandbrewing.com, where you can take a wide variety of online courses in brewing. Also, the offer code BEERSMITH2017 gives you 20% off when you sign up for any of their online courses. Learn more about brewing at learn.beerandbrewing.com. And also the new BrewVision Thermometer from Blickman Engineering. This interactive wireless digital thermometer connects right to your iPhone or iPad and lets you remotely monitor your record temperatures. You can download your recipes right from the BeerSmith cloud and set updates and alerts while you brew. Get the BrewVision Bluetooth thermometer today. Another great innovation from BlickmanEngineering.com. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, Beersmith Software, the industry standard for home and professional brewers. It lets you design great beer recipes and brew with confidence. Download your free 21-day trial from Beersmith.com today. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, my guest is Dr. Charlie Bamforth. He's professor of malting and brewing science at the University of California at Davis. Charlie specializes in the study of wholesomeness of beer, including beer perception, polyphenols, foam stability, oxidation and flavor stability. This is actually Charlie's ninth time on the podcast, uh, and he's one of my favorite guests. Charlie, it is great to have you back on the show. Thanks, Brad. It's nice to be here. I always enjoy it, so it's good to speak to you. Number nine, you I think you're the only guest that's been on the show more than I have, actually. Oh, my. Or as much as I, or, or, except for me, I guess. I, I, I've been on 164 episodes so far. All right, well, that's I get a little okay. catching up to do. It, it's... <laughs> Well, it's your baby, not mine, but uh, it's, it's um, well, nine times. <laughs> nine times, I, I, yeah. I'll probably run out of things to talk about now, haven't I? I don't no, know. no, no, not at all. Hmm. So um, it's great to have you back on the show. What have you been up to uh, as you've been, I think you've been preparing for your semi-retirement, right? Is that your latest project? Well, well it, it, my wife thinks it's my full retirement. So uh, technically speaking, it's, it's full retirement, but you... You'll still hear bits and pieces of me. So, we, yeah, I retire at the end of the year, and uh, we're looking for my replacement right now. We've got uh, some interesting candidates, and um, uh, but I'm still busy doing lots of other things. Um, uh, just submitted to uh, the American Society of Brewing Chemists the fourth uh, uh, text for the fourth book in the series on quality. So the next one's on color and clarity. Um, two more of those to go. We're actually, uh, I'm actually recording those, uh, that material, um, as, uh, classes, um, online classes as part of UC extension. So, uh, we're hoping to launch that, uh, this year. And so people can do a class on, uh, foam and flavor and freshness and then color and clarity. And then the two remaining books in the series. So each class matches up with one of the books. Um, busy doing a few other book projects and uh, looking forward to uh, teaching summer abroad again um, in Nottingham, England uh, during the month of July. It's the third time we've done that. So just in case there's anybody out there listening to this who are fully paid up student members uh, on a campus somewhere in the States, uh, take a look at it, go to my website and follow the link through to UC uh, Summer Abroad, Study Abroad, and um, come study with me in Nottingham, England. It's a lot of fun. And that's the uh, University of California, uh, Davis, right? Brewing program. Um, it is the UC Davis Brewing Program, but <laughs> uh, I teach the class for the whole of the month of July. And we, we base ourselves in the University of Nottingham, but uh, we have four uh, field trips. Uh, the first week, we go to a malt house, Muntons, up in uh, the northeast of England. Second week, we'll be going to the L Goods Brewery in Cambridgeshire. The third week, we'll be going to a hop yard in Hereford and Worcester. And the fourth week, we go to Murphy's, which is in Nottingham, and, and that's where they make the Isinglass finings for the uh, for the brewing industry. So um, it's, it's a lot of fun. I, I really enjoy doing it, and uh, we got a lot of passionate students, and um, yeah, it's a great way to study brewing. I'm trying to remember. Is that where you're from? Where are you from? Yeah. 
Oh, I'm from uh, just outside Wigan in in northwest Lancashire. So I'm oh. from half halfway between Manchester and Liverpool. But uh, I, I am actually a visiting professor at uh, the University of Nottingham. But uh, this class is is quite separate from uh, from Nottingham. It just happens to be located on the main campus in uh, in Nottingham. And of course, today we were going to focus on one of your other books, uh, which is on yeast and uh, flavors. And yep. um, I was actually doing a presentation on uh, the off flavors or troubleshooting, uh, and I noted that. Uh, out of the BJCP off flavors, the one on the BJCP uh, judging sheet that people use to judge beer, uh, something like 10 of the 16 that they list uh, are potential yeast problems. Right? Yeah. Well, that doesn't surprise me. Um, you know, most of the brewing professors on the uh, planet, are their, their specialty is yeast. I, I'm the, the guy who worries much more about uh, malt and beer quality, but... Um, I, lo I love to tease the te uh, tease the yeast guys, saying, you know, at the end of the day, it's it's just a convenient way to make alcohol. But of course, I am uh, exaggerating. Um, so the yeast is very important, and it sure can uh, screw things up if you get it wrong. And uh, you sent me some excerpts from your ASBC book, uh, the handbook yep. that you wrote on beer flavor. Um, and in chapter five, you cover uh, the major flavor contributors. Uh, yep. And I, I just thought we'd walk through some of them today, and it'd be an interesting episode. Uh, let's but, start with uh, with sourness, sourness and beer. <laughs> yeah, why would you start with sourness? I mean, anyway, there we go. Well, um, usually my beer, beer ends with sourness, so, you know, <laughs> seems uh, reasonable. Yeah, yeah it is. Uh, of course, it's one of the main uh, four classic um tastes of beer sweet salt sour and bitter um and of course sourness means different things to different people um sour is uh you know all beers are sour to a certain extent they, they were all or the vast majority of beers are in the ph range 4 to 4.5 and of course sourness is a measure of acidity so the more acid something is the more sour it is um, and as I say most beers are, are there are in the 4 to 4.5 region which is fairly sour not as sour as lemon juice but but sour enough um so but for a lot of people when they talk sour they're thinking sour beers you know they're talking uh, the real uh, really acidic pro uh, products that are uh, dependent on uh, the action of uh, acid forming bacteria um mm -hmm. so we got we got to differentiate between them in terms of the sourness that for for the regular beer and the sourness that's generated from the yeast uh, then there are a number of things that are going to influence it. One is the the word. Um, how to what extent does that word hold the pH constant? Um, you know, there are buffers in 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 word that that tend to keep the pH in the sort of the mid fives, but as they are um, used up by the yeast. Uh, that contributes to the ability of the pH to be lowered, as well as the fact that the yeast actually does release acid. Mm -hmm. um, so the pH, certain, pH generally goes down as it so ferments, pH, right? Yeah, it goes down from the mid fives down to the mid to low fours. Uh, and that is, as I say, a combination of the fact that the yeast is, is releasing acid, but also you're losing, losing these buffering materials, things like peptides and small proteins and possibly one or two of the amino acids and they're going down and, uh, and therefore the buffering capacity lowers as well. So if you've got a word that has got less um, buffering capacity, you know, less say malt in it, um, then it will tend to allow the pH to drop that little bit more. And of course the vigor of the yeast, the, the, the uh, vigor of the fermentation, the extent of the fermentation is also going to influence the the pH drop. Um, so if you've got a, a, a more extensive fermentation, the pH is going to lower to a greater extent. Of course, the other thing you can do to adjust pH is, is add acids. Um, and, and also, if you're not having acids, things like calcium, they, they drop the pH of the wort because the calcium reacts with things like phosphate and possibly proteins, and they release acid. By acid, I'm referring, to the, referring, of course, to the hydrogen ion. Uh, and so the more calcium, the lower the pH. So I assume, so, the, I assume the starting water profile plays a big role as well, doesn't it? It, it, it does. And, and so uh, brewers, of course, talk about residual alkalinity, mm -hmm. um, which is contributed by bicarbonate. So the, the more bicarbonate in the water, the higher the pH is going to be because that's a, an alkali. Um, 
And that's balanced with the level of calcium and magnesium. So the more calcium and to a lesser extent magnesium, uh, the more you're going to sort of acidify things and lower the pH. Um, so you, you, in any textbook worth its salt, you can see an equation for residual alkalinity. And, you know, that's very much governed by by the water, uh, whether it's uh, fairly hard water, and if so, uh, is it temporary hard or, or permanent hardness and so on. So does, a, so does a residual alkalinity kind of give us a measure of how easy it is to move the pH then? Yes, it's a clue. It's a clue. The other thing, of course, you can test is the buffering capacity, which is of, of any a wort or beer, which is, you know, if you sort of titrate with with acid, you know, how much do you need to, to shift the pH? And the more of these buffering materials are present, uh, the more they're going to resist this uh, this pH change. Now, of course, the other thing that people talk about is is other sour beers and and deliberately trying to get more sour beers, and of course, then you're you're dependent on acid forming bacteria to a large extent, uh, typically you know the the lactic acid bacteria, and so you know for some people it's a case of using those early on. Um, you know, people talk about uh, kettle. Uh, souring and things like this. So in introducing the uh, the the acidity upstream, uh, or of course, uh, you know, for the classic sort of lambic beers and the, um, you know, the, to use vinicellas, those own words, these funky beers, uh, then of course it's it's acid forming bacteria uh, later as well in the formation of sort of the, the you know, the spontaneously fermented uh, ales and, and so on. Interesting uh, piece of work we've done recently, Brad, um, mm-hmm. has been with uh, an organism called La Chancia. Um, and um, it, it was a student of mine called Jen House. Um, she showed that, you know, you, by using this organism, La Chancia, it, it, it can carry out the primary fermentation of beer, but it also releases more acid than Saccharomyces. So using something like La Chancia, you can actually ferment and sour with the same organism. And uh, we, we published that in, uh, in the pages of the, the Journal of the Institute of Brewing. Interesting. Um, is, that, is that quicker as well? And does it produce lactic acid or some other it kind produ- of acid? It does. It does produce lactic acid. And uh, it's, it's not going to give you quite the intensity of sourness as, as lactic acid bacteria. But it, uh, you know, the beauty of it is it's, it's, it's fermentation and souring in, 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 with the use of one organism. Um, the guys over in uh, John Shepard's laboratory over in North Carolina, they, they made a big splash about this. Um, it was on PBS um, when they talked about the, this organism that came from, I think it was wasps or something that was seeding beers. That, that organism was uh, La Chancia and, and um, I'm very grateful that uh, they, they recognize the fact that it was actually House and, and the rest of us here in Davis that first published that work on La Chancia in beer. So, um, I, interesting. I had a question. I was brewing with a group out in Colorado, and they were playing with ad- adding lactic acid directly to the wort itself yeah. uh, before fermentation. I thought it was a little dicey because you're really lowering the pH quite a bit. But You are because, I mean, you've got to remember that for any of the things we're going to talk about today, you, you, you change one parameter in the interests of, of controlling a certain flavor, whether it's sourness or whatever. And if you change it uh, with the aim of, of, in this case, changing sourness, if you're not careful, you're going to influence other things. So you change the pH. That's going to influence other things. It's going to influence uh, bitterness extraction um, upstream. Um, it's going to influence uh, yeast Flocculation, possibly. It's it's going to introduce uh, in, influence lots of different things. Yeah, and I know. Have, I know from making wines and meads, if you get the pH low enough, it starts to inhibit fermentation too. Yeah, yeah. So you've got to do these things mindfully, and um, it's like I say to all of the students in my classes. You know, when you when you it's it's when you set up your your process for um, your your beer in, the beer in question. That's when you need to get it all perfected. And then once you've identified, I'm going to do all of these things and that's that will give me the beer I want, then for goodness sake, keep those conditions constant. You don't start tinkering because if you tinker with one thing, you're going to throw something else out of kilter and out of balance if, you, if you're not careful. So, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's great. Great time for experimentation if you want to make a brand new beer. 
you know, in the case of uh, sourness, it may be a gosa, something like that, with uh, with the saltiness as well. But but you know, once you've hit upon the process and the raw materials that you want to give you a certain beer, then well, that should be it, and and, and strive to make it that same way every time. Yeah, it was interesting. We had uh, just from the, on the last show, we had uh, John Blickman and Chris White from White Labs on, and they had been doing some experiments with pressure fermentation. And found out that it actually changed the bitterness level, which you might not obviously expect, for example. <laughs> which you might not. And also, the other thing to say for many of these things is, you know, people interpret, well, that's probably for this reason. Um, and it might be for some entirely different reason. You know, people make conclusions about why something does something. But often you find for these experiential observations, um, there may be two or three different explanations for why it's happening, you know, Um, and and, and they're not always entirely predictable. So (laughs) there's a lot to be said for for, you know, understanding your your system, understanding what your 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 system is capable of doing. And as I say, um, uh, using that uh, uh, same process time in, time out. And of course, it, it, it often bites brewers in the backside when they, you know, you know, they they intent on taking over the world. They, they go and buy uh, another brewery and they try to make a certain beer in a different different configuration of brewery and you know it's a very lousy match uh, mm-hmm. because all sorts of things come into play so when you talk about yeast you're not talking about just the yeast strain you're talking about all the fermentation conditions and and very much the shape and the size of the fermenter has got a huge role to play um, in what the yeast will or or will not belt out right yeah they uh, well we talked last week about pressure fermentation they were talking about even just tall fermenters you can easily reach you know, one or two atmospheres pressure uh, at the bottom of the, at the bottom oh, yeah. of the fermenter. You know, so yeah. And if it, if a yeast is 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 subjected to pressure, like anything else that's subjected to pressure, it tends to react in interesting ways. Yeah. Well, um, moving on to your book, uh, you also cover VDKs, which a lot of people may not be familiar with that term, uh, but includes diacetyl. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about diacetyl and VDKs and how those things are all formed. Yeah, so there are, there are two principal VDKs, vicinal diketones. Uh, diacetyl is the most important. Uh, the other one is pentane dione. Um, the, the, the flavor threshold, the ability to detect it, is 10 times more powerful for diacetyl. So people talk about that and worry about that, but they're both important. Uh, diacetyl smells of popcorn. It's the thing that keeps me out of movie theaters. I, I hate the smell of popcorn. Um, <laughs> but uh, pentane dione, uh, yeah, People disagree among what it smells like. Some people would say it's very similar to diacetyl. Some people say it's honey. Some people say butter, butterscotch. Um, but it's the same sort of in the same sort of ballpark in terms of its uh, uh, aroma. Now, most people hate these in beer, um, but there are some advocates for them. Some people think that some of the uh, bolder ales. Uh, you know, with a, a lot of roasted character and, uh, you know, some of the, a lot of darker malts, they, they reckon a little bit of diacetyl goes a long way. Mm-hmm. And I could tell you, it certainly goes a long way. Um, but, uh, and and then, you know, to me, I hate it. But you, you go to the Czech Republic, you go get yourself a nice, fresh Pilsner Urquell, and it's got a distinct diacetyl character. And that's what they want. They want some of it. So the, the, whatever it is, you you got to control it. You got to regulate it and 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 uh, control it every time. Um, the, the these two molecules, diacetyl and pentanedione, they they come from precursors uh, that are are spewed out of the yeast. I, li- I like to say the yeast is incontinent when it comes to uh, two things. One is called acetolactate. Uh, and one is called acetohydroxybutyrate, and, and acetolactate breaks down spontaneously in the fermenting beer uh, to give you diacetyl, and acetohydroxybutyrate breaks down to give pentanedione. Uh, that's the bad news. The, the good news is the yeast will take them up again and, and reabsorb them. Um, but you've got to give the yeast the opportunity to do that. Um, and as long as you leave nice, healthy yeast in, in contact with um, the beer, they, they, that yeast will mop up the diacetyl and, and the pentane down. But you've got you've to give the yeast the opportunity to do it. And this is one of the really great arguments for, for good, vigorous, healthy yeast. Um, if you've got 
senile yeast and it's you know staggering to to carry out its fermentation then it's going to be harder and tougher to to mop up the the vdks um now you can uh, so the, the the yeast vigor is important some brewers of course practice a, a something called croisoning and croisoning is is where um the um the the uh, the Towards the end of the fermentation, you add a very large amount of young, vigorously fermenting yeast, and that mops up, uh, helps to mop up that uh, diacetyl and pentane diol. Um, when I was with uh, Bass, I mean, we had uh, a beer called Carling Black Label. It's still the biggest selling brand of beer in uh, the United Kingdom. And uh, we used to uh, control our diacetyl and pentane dion very carefully indeed, but it didn't take weeks and weeks to do it. You know, some people think that you've got to have prolonged maturation to, to mop up the VDK. You really don't if you know what you're doing. And what we used to do um, was midway through the primary fermentation, we just used, just used to allow the temperature to rise. So we knocked off the cooling and we allowed the temperature in the fermenter to go up about three or four degrees Celsius. And what that meant was the yeast was now working faster and it would uh, mop up the diastyl and the pentane dion that much faster. And and so we were, I, I can't remember the precise amount of time we were in those fermenters, but it wasn't much more than a week. And we dealt with primary fermentation and this mopping up of the VDKs in very short order, very, very, very quickly. Um, now, those people who insist that you've really got to, you know, you've got to do it for a long time, uh, but you, you really you don't. And the other thing that's important, Brad, is that if you really got to know how to to measure this stuff. I realize that most people in this uh, listening to this podcast probably don't have a gas chromatograph. I, I'm, I'm assuming most people don't. So you're dependent on your nostrils um, to, to detect the diacetyl and the and, and pentane dion. What I recommend people do is, is, is take a small sample of that beer and before you smell it, heat it up, uh, heat it to about 80 degrees Celsius for a few minutes. And what you're doing then is, is if there's any precursor left behind, the stuff that breaks down to give the diacetyl and the pentane dion, if it's still there, that heating will break it down and release the diacetyl and the pentane dion. So now you can smell them. If you don't do that, if you just say, oh, I can't detect any diacetyl and pentane dion, it's, it, it's okay, uh, and, and I'll get rid of the yeast, I'll, I'll get the yeast off, um, that any any precursor that's left behind is progressively going to break down to give you the VDKs, and there's no yeast to mop it up again. So, so you, when you control uh, these vicinal diketones, you've got to worry not only about the diacetyl and the pentane dion, you've got to worry about the two things that they that break down to give them as uh, that. And that and that illustrates a a, t a a tool that used to be applied by a, a Finnish brewing company called Sini Brickoff. And what they used to do is they, they carry out the primary fermentation and then they'd centrifuge off the yeast and then they would uh, put the, the beer through a heat exchanger and heat it up to, uh, you know, from memory around 80 degrees Celsius for several minutes. And of course, what they were doing was, was forcing the precursors into the free vicinal diketones. Now, most people, when they heard that they were cooking this beer, they were kind of full of horror. Um, but what they used to do then was to cool it down again and trickle it through a, a column of yeast that was immobilized on the column. And that young, healthy, trapped yeast would, would mop up the, the diacetyl and the pentandion as the, as the beer trickled through. So now instead of you know, potentially having quite long maturation uh, times, you, you could actually do, deal with the VDKs in, in, literally in minutes in minutes um, hmm. to uh, to speed things up. Uh, and but the there's, there's got to be other other good reasons not to heat your beer to 80 degrees Celsius, though, right? <laughs> well, there are, but I have to say this, that, you know, this beer, and, and the brand name was Koff, K-O-F-F, -F, this beer actually was pretty defect-free. Hmm. Uh, and the other thing you see that the yeast is doing, the yeast will get rid of some of these off flavors. So if, if you heat beer really strongly and you produce a lot of these so-called carbonyls and, 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 and staling type compounds, which you will, uh, the good news is the yeast will clean them up again. It'll, it'll take them away again. So 
you know, the, the reality is they, they made a product which was very, very respectable um, and, and, and very, very drinkable. I believe the company was taken over by Carlsberg. I believe Carlsberg hated the idea, so I don't think this happens anymore. But uh, it certainly uh, was used to make quite a lot of commercial beer. And th there's mm -hmm. one other trick that I, I, would, I would mention, and that is you, you can actually buy a commercial enzyme. Uh, it goes by the trade name Maturex, and, and this is an enzyme called acetolactate decarboxylase. And what it does, um, uh, and it, you put it in the fermenter, what it does is it takes the uh, precursor of the diacetyl, the acetolactate, and it takes away carbon dioxide and it produces something called acetoin. Now, um, I hate to get all sort of biochemical, but when uh, in a conventional fermentation, when acetolactate breaks down, we call it oxidative decarboxylation. What that means is you take carbon dioxide out and you take hydrogen out and you produce diacetyl. And what the yeast does is add the hydrogen back to make acetoin. Hmm. Um, well, if you use acetolactate decarboxylase, you don't take away carbon dioxide and hydrogen. You just take away the carbon dioxide. So you leave the hydrogen where it is. So the acetolactate is converted to acetoin. So you bypass the diacetyl, and acetoin does. You can't smell the acetoin. So using this enzyme, you avoid making the diacetyl in the first place, and that's kind of neat, I think. But you know, there are a lot of people out there that really don't like the idea of putting commercial enzymes in into into brews. Personally, I I've never understood that. I I think it's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Uh, but you either love it or hate it, and brewing is all about opinions. Yeah, I've noticed that. <laughs> uh well let's talk about another section let's talk about esters of course which uh can be either good or bad very common in uh english ales for example right yeah absolutely so if you uh um, one of the important things that influences the ester level is the is the strength of the word so if you've got a, a high gravity word you you will produce a lot of uh of esters um and uh, so barley wines, for example, contain a lot of esters because the yeast is, is working hard on very high sugar levels. Um, so that is very important. Uh, but there are two other very important, well, there are several very important things. The yeast strain is, 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 is significant. Different yeast strains make different amounts of esters. But um, th there are other things uh, as well that are important. And one of them is how much oxygen um, the yeast has got to play with. If the yeast is is given a lot of oxygen, uh, then it will it will take the, um, the the building blocks and make them into the the components of the membranes. It'll make a lot of yeast membranes, and it allows you to make more yeast uh, cells. And it will grow, uh, and and you get a, a lot of yeast production, but you get efficient fermentation. If the yeast um, does not have enough oxygen it can't complete the production of those membrane components. So what happens is you build up and you accumulate the building blocks. Now, um, again, let's, let, uh, let's go right back to the basic biochemistry. The, 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 the building block, the main one, is something called acetyl-CoA. It's basically acetic acid. Um, and it, it couples together. Acetic acid has got two carbons. So if you put two of those together, you get C4. And then you get six carbon atoms. And these are the short chain fatty acids, okay? And eventually you get to the long chain fatty acids uh, by building up more and more of these blocks, putting them together. And then the very last stage in making the membrane is adding oxygen. And if you add the oxygen, then you make the membrane components, the so-called unsaturated fatty acids and the sterols. So if you don't have enough oxygen, uh, you can't complete that process. So you get a buildup of First of all, you get a buildup of the short-chain fatty acids, things that will give you aromas like wet dog and goat and things like that. But you also get a buildup of the, the, the acids, and they react with alcohols to form esters. So in other words, if you don't have enough oxygen, you'll produce more esters. So there's this relationship between um, um, uh, the oxygen level and the esters. The more oxygen, uh, the less esters. Um, the other thing that's very, very important 
is uh, sorry, my telephone's going. That's off okay. Too. It happens. Yeah. Now, the, um, the, the, isn't temperature coming to play as well? I think right. Temperature, temperature does, and, and the main reason temperature comes into play is um, the more, the higher the temperature, the more of the alcohols you produce. An ester is produced when you react an alcohol with an acid, mm -hmm. and that will give you an ester. So if you got ethanol, the main alcohol in beer, and you got acetic acid, you get ethyl acetate, which smells of pears. If you got isoamyl alcohol um, and you got acetic acid, you get isoamyl acetate, which of course smells of bananas. You got phenyl ethanol and acetic acid, you get phenyl ethyl acetate, which smells of roses. So as many alcohols as you've got, and as many acids you've got, you've got that potential number of esters as well. So there are many of them. The ones that most brewers worry about are the, the isoamyl acetate, particularly because it's got the lowest flavor threshold, the highest detectability, and ethyl acetate or ethyl acetate. Uh, but there are others as well. Now, the alcohols, the more vigorous the fermentation, the more of those alcohols you're going to produce. So if you tend to ferment at higher temperatures, you produce more of these alcohols, which are going to spill over into the esters. So, uh, <laughs> so these are the higher higher level alcohols, right? The yeah, so they're, well, they call them higher alcohols. Some people call them fusel oils. Fusel, um, yeah, fusel alcohols. Right? Um, yeah, um, and some people say, well, they're responsible for headaches and hangovers. I, I think that's unlikely. Um, there but, could be uh, other causes for the hangovers, possibly. Oh yeah, oh yeah, um, like some of the aldehydes and key, and carbonyl compounds and, and or drinking and, too much. Uh, well, they, yeah, they tend to go hand in hand. And the polyphenols, you know, some of those I think can, can cause uh, problems, tannins. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, so on the one hand, the more you promote yeast growth, the more you're going to produce these alcohols, and some of them will spill over into esters. Um, but the esters um, are going to be influenced by other things to a greater extent, including the oxygen. Um, and the other thing that's very relevant for ester production, uh, coming back to something you were talking about earlier on, mm -hmm. is the hydrostatic pressure. The more uh, hydrostatic pressure on the yeast, um, then the less ester is produced. So if you want to make a, a beer with a, a, a significant ester character, then you really don't want a, a very high um, hydrostatic pressure. I, uh, there's two examples that I, I, I often give to the students, and, and uh, you know, I, I, I'll give them now. One is, you know, I, I know of one very, 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 very large brewing company, and I know of, you know, two, two breweries that are only within a 1,000 a or 2,000 miles of, of one another, and one of them, they have horizontal fermenters, and in the other one, they have deep, vertical, so they're conical fermenters. And the ester level coming out of the, the torso and the conical vessels is significantly less than it is out of the horizontal vessels because of this hydrostatic pressure effect. Uh, and the other example, um, there's a, a wonderful brewery here in Northern California. Uh, they make a, a famous barley wine. They make a famous, uh, relatively new, but still well-known uh, Hefeweizen, and those uh, brews, they never ferment them in cylinder conical fermenters, these tall fermenters. They only ever ferment them in the, op the square open fermenters, and that's because there's less hydrostatic pressure and, and therefore more esters. And in a Hefeweizen and in a barley wine, you want esters. Yeah. So and that, I, was, I was just going to say, we, we did the uh, last episode, I told you Chris White uh, and John Blickman were doing pressure fermentation, and they were trying to get something close to a lager. So they were using right. lager yeast uh, and fermenting it under pressure, and they were able to right. get the ester levels down to the same level as they did uh, at lager temperatures, at room yeah. temperature by using pressure. Uh, obviously, Correct. they weren't able to duplicate everything, like some of the sulfur flavors and so on didn't come Correct. through, but, but still made no, a don't... really nice beer with it. Yes, of course. And I, I, you see, I don't know that anybody will could actually put their hand up and, and stand up in a court of law and actually say why pressure lowers ester levels. But it does. Uh, Fosters in Australia, they've used pressurized fermenters for, for a long time uh, to, to keep the ester level down. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, it's, it's one of these experiential observations, but pressure um, certainly is extremely important when it comes to controlling esters. Mm hmm um, well, closely related to this, we were talking about it just a minute ago, was alcohol, uh, which is a yeast byproduct, but uh, one that we enjoy, but not all of them are desirable, right? Correct. Um, 
and it, it really depends on um, on the style of beer, of course. And you're going to have substantially higher levels of some of these higher alcohols in 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 certain ales than you are in in lagers. Um, the bottom line is that um, if you got an alcohol, you got an ester, you you would worry much more about the esters than the alcohols. The the esters tend to have much lower flavor thresholds than the equivalent alcohols. Mm-hmm. So, so you know, the flavor threshold for ethyl alcohol, ethanol, the main alcohol in beer, is really quite high. But thankfully, thankfully, there's there's a significant amount of alcohol in 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 any decent beer, which is above the flavor threshold, but it's still quite high. But the flavor threshold for ethyl acetate is a fraction of that of the alcohol. So, you know, the esters make much more uh, of a contribution. The alcohols do have a role to play. Um, the descriptors that are used for some of these alcohols, they're, they're not particularly helpful, you know, like alcoholic, uh, warming, yeah. uh, this sort of thing. So they're, they're not as well articulated, probably because they're not as important as the esters. But the bottom line with, with the alcohols is the more vigorous the fermentation, uh, the more alcohol you're going to produce. So things like increasing the temperature, um, increasing the – the um, actually the turbidity in the fermenter. Uh, because uh, the turbidity is is going to allow the yeast to um, allow the carbon dioxide to be released. We produce bubbles. The yeast moves around in the fermenter more. You get better contact to the yeast with the wort, and therefore you speed up the fermentation. And that's going to influence the alcohol level, and in turn, it's going to influence the ester level as well. So what do you got to do? You got to keep the same degree of wort clarity every time. You can't have if you pardon the French work one day and, and crystal clear work the next, you gotta you got to have the same degree of turbidity every time. So keep the process uh, constant. So uh, let's see, I, 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 the next section I read was on acids, and I actually found that pretty interesting. Um, you know, can you tell us, for example, how fatty acids uh, are created and how they create problems in your finished beer? Yeah, like like I was saying earlier on, they, they they're progressively built up from the building block. So, yeah, um, I I urge uh, the listeners to come do a class with me at Davis, one week class before I drop off this mortal coil. But uh, um, what happens is the the yeast makes um, a, a metabolite a, meta- a, a substance called pyruvic acid, and lots of things hinge around the pyruvic acid. Uh, it, for example, it goes to acetaldehyde and therefore goes to alcohol. So that's one route. Uh, pyruvate also goes to make acetolactate, which is going to get, break down and give you diacetyl. So that's another thing that happens to it. The pyruvic acid also um, goes into the so-called Krebs cycle, a tri- uh, tricarboxylic acid cycle, by way of something called acetal-CoA. And, um, and certain acids are made in that, like citric acid. Um, but the, 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 the acetyl CoA or the acetic acid, the CoA is just a carrier, it carries it. So it's, it's acetic acid, basically, in an activated form. It's got two carbon atoms. And what happens is uh, two of them react together. So you get four carbon atoms now. So that's butyric acid, which will s- uh, smell kind of buttery. And then you put on another two and you get hexanoic acid. I can't remember off the top of my head what that smells of, but I can tell you that oxazenoic acid, which has got eight carbon atoms, smells of goats and so on. So um, these short-chain fatty acids are built up in this way, and uh, they're very much dependent on the yeast strain again, but they are very much dependent, like I said earlier on, on the amount of oxygen. Um, if you get a lot of oxygen, then they're going to get mopped up. They're going to be converted into still longer chains that are, are not going to have these undesirable flavors or desirable flavors, depending on the beer that you want. But if you get an accumulation of them, for example, by not having enough oxygen, uh, then you will you will develop some of these uh, some of these characteristics. So it really much, it really does depend on on the yeast strain, and if you want to regulate them at a certain level, um, define. What that process is that gave, gives you uh, the preferred level of these and all the other flavor components. But hopefully, the way I've just described that uh, illustrates the fact that all these things are interrelated, you know? So the, this pyruvate, this pyruvic acid, going in all these different directions. And so some of it goes to alcohol and some of it goes to acetyl CoA and some of it goes to acetolactate. Um, and, um, <laughs> you know, how do you apportion which 
which goes in which direction? And the answer is you choose your yeast, you choose the age of the yeast, you choose the vigor of the yeast, you control the vigor of the yeast and the health of the yeast, you put in the right amount into the right wort, the right temperature, in the right vessel, and, and, and specify those conditions. And then that's where the art comes in. We can, we can explain the science individually. Uh, for each of these individual molecules, but the point is they are interrelated. And if you focus on one and say, well, I need to increase the level of that, if you're not careful, it'll bite you in the posterior and you'll find that something else changes. You know, going back but to what I said. You are making a really strong case for aeration, though, getting enough oxygen into the wort, right? Getting enough oxygen to, 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 for the yeast to, uh, to, to be able to multiply. If you don't have enough oxygen uh, at one extreme, you're going to have a stock fermentation. Um, if you put in too much oxygen, you are going to produce more yeast. And, you know, the, the carbon's got to go somewhere. It goes to, ultimately, the bulk of it goes either into yeast cells or into alcohol. So the more oxygen you give the uh, the yeast, the more yeast you're going to produce and a little bit less alcohol. Now, if you're if you're running the Dog's Posterior Brewing Company um, and you're brewing a bucket a week, it doesn't really matter. But if you are the world's biggest brewing company, they, they're meticulous in controlling the oxygen to very, very precise levels because if they grow uh, a lot of yeast, that means that the amount of beer they produce has significantly decreased. So, you know, how much do you give it? Ideally, exactly the right amount. If you're going to err on the side of anything, I would say err on the side of, of, of more oxygen rather than less, because the last thing you want is a stock fermentation. But the important thing is you, you, you got to control these things. Going back to something I said earlier on, Brad, I said that mm -hmm. in Bass, we, we, we used to allow uh, the temperature to rise midway through the fermentation. And we, the way we did that, uh, the reason we did it was to control the VDKs. Hopefully, the listeners will realize that if you do that, then you, you are going to tend to produce somewhat more higher alcohols. Um, but the important thing is that was built into the process for fermenting carling black labels. So it was all part of the process. But if you suddenly say you're making a certain type of beer and you say, oh, I'm, I'm going to start giving it a free temperature rise midway through the fermentation, then you've got to be very mindful of the fact that actually you, you might just start increasing your alcohol levels and therefore possibly some ester levels as well. <laughs> so you, you can't just do it on a whim. Um, and that's why, like I said, you know, what seems like an eternity ago now, um, once you've decided what you, what you want to make and, uh, and how you're going to make it, stick at it. And if you change, you, you're going to run the risk of changing the flavor. Well, let's, uh, I think we got time for maybe one more. Let's talk about uh, sulfur, which uh, many of us very closely associate with lager fermentation. Uh, certainly one of the strongest uh, aroma compounds uh, we pick up from yeast. Can you talk, yeah. tell us about sulfur? Well, any molecule that's got sulfur in it tends to be a bit whiffy. Um, uh, Sulfur-containing substances have got extremely low flavor thresholds, very uh, easy to detect. Um, so there are a bunch of these. You know, there are a bunch of macaptans, which give you sort of uh, rubbery flavors and vegetable flavors. There's methylthioacetate, which gives you kind of a, a cabbagey flavor. The two that most uh, brewers talk about is hydrogen sulfide and dimethyl sulfide, DMS. Uh, H2S, you know, it's a no-no in most beers, um, but not all. So if you go to Burton-on-Trent and, um, and have a classic Burton ale, let's say a, a pint of Marston's pedigree, you expect a little bit of sulfur on the nose, a little bit of hydrogen sulfide. There's a, a, a two-word two descriptor for that, which I can't uh, use in polite society in this country. Uh, it's okay in England, but it's not in this country. That's okay. It's a Oxford, clean show. so Yeah, yeah. So I won't say it. But if you go to the Oxford uh, Companion to Beer, or, um, then you'll, you'll find an entry. The Burton something. But that's hydrogen sulfide. A little bit of hydrogen sulfide is wanted there. Most beers not. Um, so... Um, the, the way to uh, prevent having excessive hydrogen sulfide is to make sure your fermentation is vigorous. You have a vigorous fermentation. Um, and the yeast is working vigorously. It's, it, it, all the carbon dioxide will wash away that hydrogen sulfide. Um, now, in the world of wine, of course, they don't have very vigorous fermentation, so they do tend to have a significant problem with uh, hydrogen sulfide. Uh, the way many of them uh, solve it is to add copper sulfate. Mm -hmm. And a little bit of copper 
will uh, bind the hydrogen sulfide and uh, take it out of harm's way. Um, I might have used this uh, story on, on your show before, but uh, I remember one guy in Bass coming into my office one day when I was a QA manager um, saying, uh, look at this, and it was a, the beer was blue. And I said, what's, the, what's that? He said, well, you're the smart-ass PhD. You, you tell me. All I know is I've just had a pint, and it was good. And what he'd done is miscalculate and added far, far too much uh, copper sulfate to mop up the hydrogen sulfide in this beer that tended to have too much hydrogen sulfide. So he, he had his stomach pumped, and we stopped using copper. Yeah. Um, a little, a little copper, bit of did, copper. Have, didn't you tell me before though that this was a couple episodes back? But you told me that copper can have some negative impacts oh, on the long term storage, right? Yeah, copper is very, 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 very bad news for flavor stability. Uh, if you, if you, if you, if you do feel you need to use it to mop up too much uh, hydrogen sulfide in a, in a beer. Uh, then about 0.1 milligrams per liter or part, part per million is the way to go. Some people actually have a little bit of copper pipe or a little welded copper plate in a in the gleaming stainless steel brewery just to leach enough copper into the wort to mop up the hydrogen sulfide. But it is bad news for for um, flavor stability. Uh, DMS. Um, DMS comes from uh, the malt. Ultimately, there's a precursor in the malt. It's called SMM. And it breaks down uh, due to heat. And um, uh, if there's SMM in the malt, it, it's broken down in the boil. And if you have vigorous boil and a prolonged boil, uh, this precursor SMM is, is broken down to DMS and it goes zooming up the chimney, up the stack, and it's lost. But if you don't break all of it down, um, you go into the whirlpool stand and any SMM that survives, um, it's hot enough in the whirlpool, the uh, uh, hot work receiver, to break down the SMM, but it's not turbulent, so the DMS stays behind. Yeah, and I've, I've run into a number of commercial breweries that don't have a really good uh, stack set up either. <laughs> correct, correct. <laughs> and and if, the stuff yeah. tends to, uh, I, I've seen cases where it, it actually, you know, they've got a cold stack coming out of the boiler, and, and it basically just... Uh, yeah, it runs back down the inside of the ventilation shaft, basically, Correct. right back into the pot. Correct. And if you don't have a vigorous boil, uh, uh, and, it, and it's like a simmer, um, then the DMS just stays behind. But um, so, so a huge amount of DMS can come from this source. But the other source is the yeast. Um, and what the yeast does, it... Uh, it will take away the oxygen from something called dimethyl sulfoxide. Um, and, and Brian Annis and I were the first people to show this in, back in 1979. How old is, how long ago is that? It is time I retired. Um, and we found that there's DMSO that is produced during the kilning in the malt. And this DMSO, which is very heat resistant, it just dissolves in the wort and it goes into the fermentation and the yeast will... Uh, convert the DMSO, take off the O and make DMS. And um, this is a significant source of, of DMS. Um, and it's very, this, the ability of yeast to make DMS is very much dependent on the temperature. The lower the temperature, the more DMS will be made by the yeast. And the other very important thing is the shape of the fermenter. Again, if you've got a lot of purging with CO2, like a shallow fermenter, you're going to purge off the DMS much more than in a deep vessel, a cylinder conical vessel. And this DMS is just going to stay behind to a greater extent. Um, if you analyze how much carbon dioxide comes off a uh, fermenter, the main contaminant is DMS. Um, and so it looks on paper like, you know, there's a lot of DMS in the wort and there's much less in the, in the beer. And therefore, people naively say, well, that, the DMS is all coming from the wort. Uh, it's a balance. It's a balance between how much DMS is lost with the fermentation gases and how much new DMS is, is made by the yeast. And as I say, it's, it is dependent on the yeast strain. It's dependent on the temperature, as I've said, and also dependent on how much uh, amino acid you've got, how much free amino nitrogen. If your yeast is hurting for amino acids, it will tend to produce more uh, DMS. There was a study by, back in the day in uh, Leuven in Belgium by the forerunner of InBev, Interbrew, and of course their flagship brand was uh, Stella Artois. And what they um, showed was that 80% of the DMS uh, in that beer actually comes from uh, yeast metabolism, from yeast uh, 
uh, converting DMSO into DMS. So it, it is something you, 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 you can't ignore. And again, how do you control it? The, to sound like a broken record now, you control <laughs> the, the process and the yeast strain and the age of the yeast and how much yeast you put in and what the wort is, what the temperature is, what ferment you're using and so on. Then you'll get control. Well, Charlie, uh, do you have any final advice on managing yeast uh, to reduce the off flavors in your beer? I, yeah, it sounds like a lot of it's common sense, but uh, can yeah, you go over is. a few of the key points again? Well, as I say, and, and, and it certainly is and now has become a broken record, uh, <laughs> what, uh, what you have to do is specify your yeast strain, um, look after that yeast, uh, make sure it's uh, in, in prime condition, ensure its viability, pitch it at the right level, uh, pitch it into wort of a consistent gravity and a consistent clarity, control the oxygen level that you're giving to that yeast, control the uh, clarity of the work, control the fermentation vessel, um, control all those parameters. Um, and if you give that wort, the same wort to the same yeast, uh, day in, day out, it should um, uh, produce under the same conditions the flavor spectrum uh, that you want. Awesome, Charlie. Well, thank you again for, uh, for coming on the show. Really appreciate you being here. Always a pleasure. Keep asking me. I will. I, I'm, I'm hoping to get your email before you retire, uh, whatever your whatever your personal email is. I assume no, no, we, can, no, I, we can run Skype from the house, can't you? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it'll be the same email. It'll be the same. Okay, we'll be able what, to track what, you down what, there. Whether the university charged me for it or not, I don't know. You never know, know these days. I don't know whether it's one of the perks of retirement or not. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> Part yeah. of you make it part of your retirement contract or plan. Yeah, I'll, right? I'll, I'll do that. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> well, again, today, uh, today, my guest was Dr. Charlie Bamforth. He's professor of blue, brewing and <laughs> brewing and Bluing, malting yeah. science. Yeah, brewing, <laughs> brewing and malting science at the University of California, Davis. Uh, he's author author of the ASBC Handbook on flavor, as well as uh, I don't know how many other books. Probably twenty something other books, right, Charlie? About, about yeah. that, including the, including the one on soccer goalkeepers. Don't soccer goalkeepers, that's my favorite, personally. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, thanks again for coming on the show. Appreciate it, Charlie. Pleasure. Well, a big thank you to Dr. Charlie Bamforth for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Their educational program lets you learn about every aspect of brewing in detail. Take advantage of their fantastic sale and get 20% off any of their courses when you use the offer code Beersmith2017 at learn.beerandbrewing.com. And also Blickman Engineering, creators of the innovative new BrewVision wireless thermometer. Remotely monitor your brewing system from your iPhone or iPad, record data, set alerts, and grab recipes directly from Beersmith. The BrewVision thermometer, another great innovation from BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, Beersmith Software, the industry standard for home and professional brewers. It lets you design great beer recipes and brew with confidence. Download your free 21-day trial from Beersmith.com today. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week. Mm-hmm.